Hello, Mike. And thank you. And hello, everyone, for listening to this particular study. And hello to you. And thank you, too, for joining us in another episode of our current Broken Bread series. And I'll say this again. You can find these studies in all kinds of places. Bible-based podcasts at biblebase.com at our Facebook group, Friends of Bible Base, as a text version in our Bible-based blog post, and always at newliferadio.co.uk with Mike Coles. This series is entitled The Better Covenant Revisited, a reference to a book I wrote more than ten years ago now called The Better Covenant. So we are revisiting the themes, not just rehashing uh, but adding other things to it, and sometimes diving deeper and sometimes going wider. And in the last two or three studies, I've been trying to set the scene for Romans chapter 6 and one particular part of it. And in today's study, I want to really try to drill down into a few vital verses. So this study is entitled the body of sin destroyed question mark okay the body of sin destroyed question mark let's see how we get on this is the passage of scripture i want to keep at the forefront of our minds and i will return back to this frequently in the course of the studies that we're occupied with now it's Romans chapter 6, verses 3 to 7. And we'll go back a little bit and forward a little bit. This is verse 3 to verse 7. Or do you not know, says Paul, that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And this is his reasoning. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, now there are some vital things here that we need to be sure that we know. Knowing this, that our old man was co-crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So, not many words in that, but what is the issue to all this. Well, when on the day of Pentecost Peter spoke about David, he said, The Spirit of God spoke by the mouth of David, and it is my strong conviction that in these epistles we have the Spirit of God speaking through the heart, the mind, and the pen of Paul. These are inspired. So, we're not going to be disputing what he says. Let other people waste their time on that if they want to. Uh, we're going to try and see what he meant. And, of course, remember, coming from chapter 5 and verse 12, we're now in the territory of what I've called a few times the much more of the gospel, where Paul moves from the forensic background of justification by faith and moves forward into the whole issue of what I call the dynamic of life. So in the first part, we're dealing with the forensic, the law background, and God's way of having dealt with that using the picture of the Roman law court. Now we're coming into something which is much more dynamic. So just a very quick flashback then. I've said that this section begins at Romans 5 and verse 12. And that verse distinguishes between sin, with a capital S, which is a noun, and sin, 
with a small s, which is a verb. Now, sin with a capital S is not an individual transgression of a known law, but it is a new entity, a life force, if you like, a death force, a ruling power. Sin, with a capital S, behaves like a person. Theologically, we might use the personal pronoun he. He reigned. This is some quotations from Young's literal version of the Bible. It is still a very, very useful tool, this, in Bible study really because it's so pedantic. It's not very readable in many places. You have to think it through. But let me plunge in. This is Romans chapter 5 and verse 14. And listen carefully how he keeps on putting the definite article in. Actually, Greek doesn't have a definite article. It's just got an article. So that's why I hesitated as to whether to call it the definite article. Okay, it's the word the. So let me read it to you. But the death, now this article can sometimes work like a relative pronoun. So, the death, or if you like, that death. But that death did reign from Adam to Moses, even over those not having sinned in the likeness of Adam's transgression, who was a type of him who was coming. And then in verse 17 of chapter 5, he says, For if by the offence of the one, if you like that one, if by the offence of that one, that death did reign through that one, much more those who, uh, in the abundance of grace, of the free gift of righteousness, are receiving in life, shall reign through that one, Jesus Christ. I told you it wasn't very easy to read because it's trying to follow the exact order of the words. This is verse 21. That even as that sin did reign in that death, so also that grace may reign through righteousness to age-enduring life through Jesus Christ. And then in Romans 6 and verse 12, he says, Let not then that sin reign in your mortal body to obey it in its desires. So you can you can see we've got this kind of picture coming through of a throne here, of something reigning which demands our obedience. This is the way that Paul is expressing one of the deepest mysteries of the human race, that we're not now as we were created. Through one man's sin, Adam, sin, with a, that was a small s, with one man's sin, that's just an event, this sin with a capital S entered into the human race, entered into the cosmos, came into our world, if you like. Our world wasn't like this to begin with. But something happened, and it happened through the entrance that was afforded by Adam, who is the old man, way, way back. Oh, they don't come any older than Adam. So that's young. And the issue is this. Maybe you've already begun to see it. The issue is, if we have been... I'm going to read here from Romans 6 and verse 3 and 7, and I'm then going to split it up into parts. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this. Now these are revelation facts for people who have been baptized into Christ Jesus. These are truths that God makes clear to their hearts, either sooner or later. Knowing this, that our old man was co-crucified together with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. So you can see in contrast to what he was saying kind of earlier, we now come into a place where he refers to this old man. It's really a, 
a way of expressing what we have become in Adam. And he goes on to say these things. And how do we define this phrase, the body of sin? It's the only time Paul uses it. Paul wasn't down on the body. He knew that it could be um, kind of a beachhead for temptation. But he wasn't down on the body. He wasn't a Greek after the manner of those who said that the body was a prison. And really, the sooner you got rid of it, the more free you would be. That wasn't Paul's view at all. When he spoke of the body, when I think he wrote to Philippians, was it? When he said he spoke about the body of our humiliation. Our body has been hum humiliated. It's been humbled. It's fallen as a consequence of what happened to Adam. So we're talking in that sense, in the Philippian sense, of the physical body. But when Paul talks about the body of sin, I am absolutely convinced that he is not talking about the physical body. He's talking about the entity that came into existence as a result of that old man, our old man, opening the door to sin. The consequence being that man became what he had not been. He became indwelt and in fellowship with another spirit. Let me say something to you, and this will probably shock you, but I, I want you to really be alert to what happened in Eden. I hope this doesn't shock you too much. It was as though Satan came to the man and said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears the voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Now you may be absolutely aghast at that. You say, well, how dare you do that? That's what Jesus said to the church at Laodicea. I know. I know. And it's because of what Adam did that Jesus has to come and make the same offer. You see, what happened was that Adam entered into a union with an alien spirit. He entered, if you like, into fellowship with him. He entered into a unity with him. And the consequence of that was that it brought an entity into being, uh, the human race as an entity, under the wrong head, under the headship of an evil spirit. So how are we going to define the body of sin? Is it this body of sin still operational or functional in the life of one who has been baptized into Christ Jesus? Are we in Adam and in Christ at the same time? Which body are we part of? Are we part of the body of sin or are we part of the body of Christ? Do you remember that last time we were together we were talking about being baptized into his death and in fact it maybe it was the last two times we were together so please do check upon these if these are a struggle for you to understand so i'm going to go through that little list again i'm going to re 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 refer to that phrase again those verses from romans 6 verses 3 and 7 and i'll pause at each little each little phrase if we have been united together in the likeness of his death. Now that is Paul linking back to the very beginning of chapter 6, where he says, don't you know that if you've been baptized into Christ Jesus, and then he goes on to tell them some things that they ought to know, if they have been baptized into Christ Jesus. Now to those who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, he said certain things. And now he says, if we, who is we? Well, the we is people who have been baptized into Christ Jesus. If we have been united in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, and here's the first phrase, that our old man was co-crucified with him. Now, this really is a difficult concept and one that sometimes I think you only kind of see it with your peripheral vision. If you look into it, it becomes difficult to, for me to 
any way to get a grip of. But I see it. I, I, I see the shape of it. I see the form of it. Our old man was co crucified Our old man was what the human race had become in Adam. It was the human race in Adam under the wrong head. And on the cross, Jesus became sin for us, that we who were the sinners um, might know fellowship with God. So you can almost kind of put these two into two different compartments. The old man is sin without fellowship with God. He's the human race under the wrong head, indwelt by the wrong spirit, and unable to have real fellowship with God. Our old man was co-crucified with him. This is the reign of sin. Is it the reign of sin operating in the human race, or is it the continuing of the reign of sin with the capital S in each individual? In other words, are we talking here about my personal old man, or am I talking, or am I reading about, am I reading about our single old man whose other name is Adam and who is the federal head of a race that's now under the wrong head and indwelt by the wrong spirit. The entire human race, except for those who have been baptized into Christ Jesus. So, the reign of sin operating in the human race, that one man whose transgression created a race in Adam, or is it the continuing reign of sin in each individual? So, is he talking about what happens to my old man, or is he talking about our old man? My personal conviction, <laughs> very strong one, is that he's talking about the reign of sin that operates in the human race. And I'll read you a little couple of verses from a Wesley hymn that talks about the reign of sin. So it's not talking, in my view, of the continuing of the Adam in each individual, my personal ruling power of sinship. It's not talking about that. It's talking about our old man, our joint old man. Not just in the genes, but in whose spirit we have become those who are in alienation from God. In those verses that we're reading, it goes on to say, Our old man was co-crucified with him. And then in verse 2 it says, so that the body of sin might be destroyed. So, what's the body of sin here? Is the body of sin my son, my body, under the domination of a sinful nature? Now, that is the most common interpretation of these verses. But I don't want to be common to you. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm really joking. But this is an important issue. And I, I, I don't take the common ground on this at all. I think, again, that when it speaks about the body of sin, it's speaking about the collective body. If you like, it is the satanic counterfeit of those who are in Christ, of those who are Christ's body. So he says that the old man, Adam's single entity that came into being as a result of his single sin, that our old man was co-crucified with him so that the body that was brought into being as a result of him, the body of sin. Now, the old King James Version, actually, the, this is the new King James Version, says that it might be done away with. So, how are we going to kind of define the body of sin? Is it still operational or functional in the life of of one who is baptized into Christ Jesus? Are we in Adam and in Christ at the same time? Is there a, a civil war, a conflict that goes on all the time? Which body are we part of? I tried in the last couple of sessions that we did together to uh, nail that particular thing down as hard as I could. 
these are two mutually exclusive states. You cannot be an Adam and in Christ at the same time. You cannot be part you cannot be part of the old man and part of the new man at the same time. You cannot be in the body of sin and in the body of Christ at the same time. It they are mutually exclusive. It goes on to say, if we go back to that particular verse we looked at, our old man was co crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> our old man, what does that mean? Well, it speaks about the body of sin, knowing that our old man was crucified with him, so that, okay, so the purpose of our old Adam race being united with Christ, or Christ united with it in his death, that was done so that we, so that the body of sin might be and then you've got this phrase, done away with, might be done away with. The old King James Version, it actually says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin, remember that's the Adamic world under the wrong head, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. And that and destroyed is a very strong word. It has kind of ideas of annihilation and causing something to cease to exist altogether. Now, there's a particular version of the Bible that I use quite a bit. It's it's useful. It's done by a man named Mounts, and it's a, it's a little bit kind of literal translation. But he's he takes certain license at times. And interpret where I would prefer that he just simply translated. Then the old King James Version says it might be destroyed. Now he's quite good, Mounts, here, because he says that it's so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless. But he blots his copybook because he starts off by saying, not our old man is co crucified, but our old self. Now that really is a kind of a tragedy. Lots of modern versions opt for the word self here. The word is man. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we shall live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. And there's a whole list of things here where they use the word self, but it's the word man. And our old self is not a good translation. Self is a modern concept. It's really kind of linked with aspects of psychology and is the world's way, you might even say Adam's way, of explaining himself. I was in a country been there a few times, quite some times ago, and, and I um, got to know some of the young people there, and many of them were in their early teens, uh, late teens and early twenties. And I discovered that Everyone I talked to seemed to be going to university to do psychology. And I was talking to one of the leaders later and I said, everybody I talked to was going to university to do psychology. So, psychi yeah, psychology. <laughs> and this man said, yes, he said, they're, they're all going to find out what's wrong with them. Now, that's a very interesting kind of comment. It was said tongue with cheek. But there is a sense in which modern psychology, Freud onwards in particular, I would say, modern psychology is, is really trying to explain what's the matter with me. And I prefer to go back to the Bible to find out what's wrong with me. And I prefer to use Bible words to try and understand what's wrong with me and how Christ has remedied what's wrong with me. Because the whole concept of the self is is really not a biblical concept at all. I know we use it. I know we use it all the time. Dying to self, I know we use it. I would say try and find another word and use a biblical word to use it. Because biblical words often have built-in definitions. Whereas this word self 
it means what people want it to mean. You know that the Bible talks about having put off the old man and putting on the new man. Now, they don't, they're not consistent with this because normally they say, well, putting off the old self and putting on the new man. But you can't do that because it's the same word man each time. So listen to this phrase then. Does the Bible teach that we need to put off the old self so that we can put on a new self? I have a feeling that anything with self at the front of it isn't going to be a big improvement on anything we've had before. Self-image? I don't use that language when I'm helping and talking to people because I've got no Bible definition for it and it puts me into the territory of another way of explaining the human condition for which I find no evidence in the Scripture. So self is a modern concept and it's not used in the Bible. And it's not just a new word, it's a new concept. In my view, it's extra-biblical, and I prefer to leave it on one side when I'm doing Bible study. <laughs> Paul's topic through this section in Romans has a contrast between two men. Do you remember this? The two men, we looked at them, didn't we? And we saw how often it spoke of that man, meaning Adam, and that man, meaning Christ. And now we come to another man, the old Man, which is actually just another word for Adam's progeny. No, I, re I, I recant that word. I take that word by Adam's, pro uh, Adam's descendants, but it didn't come through descent. Go back a couple of sec uh, sections, um, studies, and you'll find out why I say that. The whole race that was one in Adam was infected from the moment of Adam's sin. And Paul's topic here is that there are two men. Which man are you in? Which body are you part of? The body of sin? Under sin with a capital S? Are you in Adam? Or are you in Christ? And in his body? We're all baptized by one spirit into one body. Now, Rendered is too strong. I've said that. It's a, it's an interesting word. It's destroyed is too strong. But there are other words for this. This is a fascinating word. Let me build a word up for you. There is a word in Greek, ergeo, which really means I work. Ergonomic. Those kind of things you get from that word. Ergeo. That means I work. You can put a prefix in front of that in Greek, that's to say a word in front of it, just the letter A. Now, in Greek, if you put the word A in front of something, it means not. So I'm a theist, but there are some people who are atheist, that's to say no God. Not agnostics, but people who say there is no God. So if you put A in front of a word, you can cancel the word out. So ergeo, meaning I work, if you put an A in front of it, and it actually loses the E, because Greek words do that at times, you get argeo. And argeo means I don't work. But you can put another prefix in front of that. This is like the German language. You can keep on adding words to it as long as your paper's wide enough. So now we've got cot cat or geto. Or geto, get or geto means I work. Or geto means I don't work. And cat or geto, kata means thoroughly, right down to the base, right down. So cat or geto actually means thoroughly not working, non functional. It isn't doing what it wants to do. It's completely like that. And, and it's one of Paul's favourite words. Paul uses it, well, it's used 26 times in the New Testament. And of those, it's used 25 times by Paul. And it's used in Paul's letter to the Romans a lot. So you can really kind of see how he's saying these things if we do it something uh, like this. If we if we look at some of these words and see what it's really saying, there's a whole list of them. And we 
discover that the really the best way of interpreting this is actually to rent to say render powerless or make non working or make of non effect okay now let's see if we can put that meaning of this word back into that sentence our old man also known as adam in his race our old man was co-crucified with him that the body of sin might be rendered of no effect really so that the he died so that those who are in him their experience of the old man is of something which has no power to execute what it wants to do. I, you, you may be noticing that I am tiptoeing around the word eradicate. Now, the reason I do this is because although eradication, God dealing with the essence of sin, the, the, the root of sin, which is where the word radical comes from, is a way of explaining the teaching of Wesley and many who hold that kind of teaching. I I do hold that kind of teaching, but I don't think that's the best word because to eradicate almost kind of seems to suggest that there is a root somewhere. And if you remove the root, then it'll all be over. Well, I, I don't think that's what the Bible teaches. I think it teaches in the corporate sense that the world that Adam brought into being the body of sin, the old man, is still unfortunately alive and functioning all too well. But for those who are in Christ, it is powerless to affect them. It's, it has no more energy than a corpse. Although, even though it's dead, it doesn't always lie down, as we shall see. Not today. At another time. But the thing for us to understand here is that this is all being done in Christ. Our old man was co-crucified with him. The body of sin was utterly neutralized, made of no effect, made utterly powerless for those who are in Christ. So that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So God has done something which has emancipated us. It's made us free from the powers that were controlling our life. That thing that was reigning in us, that thing that was insisting that we obey it, all that kind of thing, all that. Um, God has done something in Christ that means it no longer has the power over us that it exercised previously. So let's go on a little bit. Uh, the consequence of our old man having been co-crucified with Christ is that the body of sin might be rendered powerless. Cat or ghetto. And if you use these notes, I've put quite a few verses together here so that you can see them. Let me just read you just, just six verses from Romans in which Paul uses this katargeo word, which means to render powerless or to make of no effect. And he says this, and these are the translations from the New King James Version. You'll see how they're translated. For what if some did not believe? This is Romans chapter 3. Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God katargeo, of no effect? Does people's unbelief make God powerless? Of course it doesn't. Our unbelief doesn't have any effect on the power of God. It only has an effect upon our ability to receive the consequences of the power of God. A little bit later on in the same chapter, Paul is talking about the law. He says, do, the, do we then destroy the law? That's If you were consistent, that's what the AV ought to have called it. But no, it isn't. Do we neutralize the law? Do we make the law of no effect through faith? And he says, no, certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. The Bible in the New Testament generally talks about us fulfilling the law rather than us actually keeping the law. 
in chapter 4, he says, if those who are of the law of faith, faith is made katageo. It's emptied of its power. And the promise is made of no effect. And then the one that we're looking at, no, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away, so the old, um, says the New King James Version, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And then in the next chapter, he still uses it. He says, for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband. It's actually the husband law, as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, <laughs> you've got here, she is released from the law of her husband. She is katogeo from husband law. In other words, husband law no longer affects her because the husband has died. And then in chapter 7 of verse 6, but now we have been delivered from the law, ketogeo. So the law no longer has its power to exercise things on a uh, power over us. And it goes on to say, but now we have been, the law has been made of no effect, having died to that in which we were held, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So, it's a, it's a wonderful thing that God has done. This enemy of the human race, which was personified in the human race, God has done something in Christ, in the second man, the last Adam. God has done something in him which is to start all over again. And regeneration is God taking us out of the one and putting us into the other. and. <laughs> just like Moses, the mediator of the old covenant, he said to Pharaoh, we're not going to leave one hoof behind. And you may be sure that God will leave not one hoof behind. He'll take everything out, transported, you transferred, you're translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of God's love. That is a tragedy, really, that they've gone for our old self in some of the versions. It's, uh, it completely undermines this whole section. It, it, this, that, that, that one statement referring to the old man as our old self undermines the whole section from Romans chapter 5, verse 12, through to the end of um, this section in chapter 6. And it follows on, of course, no longer slaves of sin. The theme of being under an alien power continues, but we're no longer slaves of sin. If we've been united together in the likeness of death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was co-crucified with him, that the body of sin might be rendered powerless, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died, and if you are in him, you have died. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Can you believe it? Freed from sin. I promised you one or two verses from Charles Wesley. I'll resist the temptation to sing them to you. Tis finished. The Messiah dies. The reign of sin and death is o'er, and all may live from sin set free. Satan has lost his mortal power, tis swallowed up in victory. Saved from the legal curse I am, my Saviour hangs on yonder tree. See there the meek, expiring lamb, tis finished, he expires for me. Death, hell, and sin are now subdued. All grace is now to sinners given. And lo, I plead the atoning blood, and in thy right I claim my heaven. Can truth be expressed more gloriously than in the writing of Charles Wesley? I'm going to stop now. Let's pray together. 
Lord, this is not the declaration of our independence. This is the declaration of our dependence. Because we come out of one dependency and into another. We thank you, Lord, for a miracle wrought in the Spirit that takes a man out of Adam with all the consequences of it and puts us into Christ and declares that we're no longer under an alien, hostile reign, but we've been brought into the kingdom of the Son of your love. The death and sin no longer reign. Christ reigns, and these aren't just mental games to play with, but they're glorious spiritual realities. And I pray, Lord, for each one of us that you will encourage us, Lord, as we look to you to see the reality of a life lived which is no longer what it was, no longer ruled over, no longer empowered, no longer exercised under a cruel tyrant, but one Lord which has been brought from darkness into light. Lord, I do pray you will make these things real for us in our experience and so glorify the one that we seek to serve, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you again for your time, brothers and sisters. This was an intricate, difficult thing. Go over it again if you struggle. If you've got any questions, why not get in touch and we'll see if we can handle them together. In the meantime, till next time, God bless you.